All right. Hey there, Gender Media for Live Performance. We are ready for round two. So just a moment ago, the way that we looked at approaching this particular problem of having a, a kind of bin selector and a display, right, was to think about how we did that with um, control panels and things that existed only in 2D space. Right, and that's an excellent kind of control system for me to think about. But what happens if I want uh, to kind of push the boundaries of what that display might look like, or if I want to do something that um, bends some of the rules about how I work inside of a programming environment like Touch Designer, right? Like, I want to move beyond the idea that I'm just working with flat 2Ds or 2D arrays. I want to do something that uh, kind of pushes me in a different way. So let's go ahead and make another container. And we're going to start off by uh, doing, relying on some of the same rules that we've already set up. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to be 1200 by 600. And this time I'm actually going to use um, my container parameters here at the top because of the, the very different kind of approach in all of this. Right, so we're going to move here inside of my container too. And uh, we'll move to the home position in the network, and we're going to start by first looking at pieces of geometry, and first kind of diving into doing some rendering. So let's start by uh, kind of just rendering, uh, other, or doing a, a real-time rendering network, right? So we know that we need a camera, and we know that we need a geo. Um, and in this case, we're, we're going to rely on the fact that um, we're not going to use any lights in this particular render setup, uh, which is different than how we would typically work, but in this case, that is uh, the approach we're going to take. So we're going to go ahead and render this, right? We're going to drop in a render. Um, and for right now, so we can see what we're doing, let's, let's leave a light in here, because it's going to help us actually see what's going on. So the first thing that we're going to think about is um, of replacing a piece of this geo. So I don't want a torus. I'm going to go ahead and um, move here inside of my geo. I'm going to delete this torus because I don't want a torus in this particular case. I want to go ahead and grab a rectangle. I'm going to connect that rectangle to a null. And while I'm at it in here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave the size of this um, to be just one by one. That's going to be just fine for me. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn on the display and render flags here um, for my rectangle. So when I come back out here, I can see that my rectangle, lo and behold, is being rendered for me there, just like I want it to be. So here I can see that I've gone ahead and set up a kind of initial rendering network. Um, so, one of the things that I'm kind of after in this, right, is um, where in the other example what I thought about doing was using control panels to be the interface element. In this case, what I want to start to think about is how can I use pieces of geometry, right? How can I use kind of rendered environments to be my control surfaces? And so that's really what we're going to kind of dive into a little bit here uh, in a more exciting way. And the real exciting stuff is going to happen by instancing. So instancing is one of the kind of really uh, insane ways that we can start to think about making multiple copies of pieces of geometry here inside of Touch Designer. Uh, and I'll talk in class about why that's so exciting, and I'm just going to focus on the mechanics of it here in this particular tutorial because I don't want to take up too much of our time. Uh, the important thing to think about is that in this case, I'm going to go ahead and find a grid. I'd like to have a grid. And I want this grid uh, to be, I guess, 3 by 3 is probably what I want it to be. So I'd like uh, three rows and three columns. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask it to be a polygon. That's fine. I'm going to connect this to a null. And then I'm going to go ahead and actually convert this, right? I'm going to actually turn this uh, information into a data table because I want to be able to use this in a different way. So in order to do that, I'm going to right click on the outlet over here. I'm going to go to DATS. I'm going to say SOP2. So I'm going to convert this to um, a data table. SOP2 DAT. 
is what that stands for. Over here in my Geo, I'm going to come to the Instance tab. I'm going to turn Instancing on. I'm going to grab this SOP2. I'm going to drag him in over here to be the reference for our instances. I'm going to look at this, right? This is position 0, 1, 2, or position X, Y, Z. I'm going to use that for my TX, my transform X, Y, Z coordinates. And I can get to that from my drop down menu over here. 0, 1, 2. Excellent. And right now it doesn't look like anything's happened. Well, part of the reason that it doesn't look like anything has happened is because of the size of my grid, right? At one by one, uh, it's all of my instances are stacked one right on top of one another. So I'm gonna go ahead and crank this size up here uh, till we get closer to like 2.2. .2. Yeah, let's leave it at 2.2. And let's go ahead and take our camera and let's back our camera up a little bit. Right, our camera can probably go uh, back here closer to like 8. Okay, so what's going on here? What's happening in instancing is I'm taking this one piece of geometry and I'm drawing copies of it at all of the locations that are specified by the coordinates that are in this array. That means that if I was to take this grid, right, and turn up the number of rows or columns, or turn them down, right, I would have more instances. And if we were to turn the size of this up a little bit more, we could see what that means, right? Like, let's turn it up like this. And we can see how I'm building more instances here inside of this. This becomes a really powerful way to draw multiple pieces of geometry really quickly with a kind of uh, very small amount of GPU impact. Uh, to do, or a small amount of uh, CPU impact in order to do that. Okay, so let's go ahead um, and leave this guy here for one hot second. Although, to be honest, it's, you know, our, our kind of network is going to get messy here really fast if we're not careful. So before we get too far along here, let's take advantage of uh, a handy feature in here. We can box select these guys, right click on our network, and let's say that we want to collapse these selected things. So we've actually just dumped all of these guys here inside of a base. And we can see here that this guy is still looking for this soft 2 one uh, We need to kind of fix a couple things. I'm going to go ahead and rename this ref, because this is where all my references are going to live. I'm going to hit the C key to bring up my color. I'm going to make this a blue color. I like to color code things. It makes me feel like a little bit more control in the world. Um, and then let's go ahead and here in our geo, let's just make sure that we add the right reference here for us. So we're just going to make sure that it knows that it needs to look inside of uh, ref for the thing called SOC21. Perfect. That's going to keep us happy here, I think. Okay, now uh, let's go ahead and delete this light and let's look at how we could actually um, texture these guys in a way that doesn't require that we have a light present in our scene. So we're going to move inside of our geo and inside of our geo we're going to go ahead and go to materials and we're going to grab a constant. And we're going to use a constant in here because constants don't require any light in our scene, right? They don't have any shadows, which I'm not really concerned about shadows right now. Um, but that makes them really cheap kind of computationally, and that's what I'm after right here. I'm going to go ahead and connect this to a null, uh, just because that's what I like to do. And I'm going to call this null mat for a material. I'm going to come up here to geo, and in the render page, I'm going to set the material to be dot slash look inside of me for the operator call mat or material. And now we can see that everything is flat white. Right, so that's excellent. That's just what I wanted. While in here, I'm going to go ahead and call, I'm going to rename this geo and call it buttons. You can probably guess what we're up to there. I'm going to kind of scooch these guys over here to the right. I'm going to add another geo. And this geo, I'm going to call disp. This should probably look familiar so far. Let's kind of go ahead and zoom in here and, and let's think about what we need to set up. 
Right, so in here what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and delete this torus. I don't want there to be a torus. I do want a rectangle. And this rectangle, uh, I know that I want it to... I happen to know this because I've already uh, played this game, uh, that I need to change its size. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and change its size to be 3.23, 3.23, and we can play with this later. I'm going to go ahead and leave it right where it is. I'm going to attach it to a null, and I'm going to set the null to display and render, right? While I'm in here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add a constant, and I'm going to add a null, and connect these two. I'm going to call this doll Matt, because that's my name. No, I'm going to call it Matt because I want it to be a, uh, know that it's the material that I'm going to use. I'm going to come up here to display. I'm going to go ahead and go to the render page and tell it dot slash look inside me for the thing called mat or material. Now looking at this we can see that these are both drawn one right on top of one another which is not exactly what I want, right? I need to actually do a little bit of translating and moving around. So I'm going to go ahead and take this guy over here and rather than inside of this particular operator or inside of this, can, uh, this geometry, here on the outside in the X form I'm going to go ahead and use the translate here to move it to the right. And I'm going to go ahead and put it at 3.23. I think that's about where I want it to be. Let's take a little closer look. Ooh, 331, actually. I think 332 is closer to the winner, just in terms of what my eyeballs like. Okay, so, so far so good, right? This looks very strikingly similar to what we had before. Right? With, mm, this looks like maybe just like, uh, it's like a little bit too big. That's okay. We'll let it. Um, if we look at it right, we can see that, lo and behold, we're getting really close to that other system that we had. But this guy is centered, and this is like way over here to the right. Uh, well, first things first, let's change a part of our render, right? So in my render, I'm going to go ahead and set this to be based off of the operator that is, or actually let's do this, we'll use mean.parent. I want my parent's uh, width, I don't think we can do that, uh, par, we shouldn't, oh lovely, we can do that. I want my parent's parameter called width, and I want my parent's parameter called height. Excellent, so now we're rendering at the right dimensions here for what it's going to display inside of our parent. And then I'm going to go ahead and think about my camera location. So my camera location needs to be translated a little bit to help me center these guys. So I'm going to use the X, uh, X form of my camera to translate here a little bit. And this is going to allow me to kind of center this right inside of my display area. Perfect. And let's get in here a little bit closer, and we can kind of make sure that we, we're dialed in right in the place that we want. And I think I want more like 6.6. 6. Mm, 1.66 looks pretty good to my eyeballs right there. Okay, so we're looking pretty, pretty solid in terms of kind of recreating the kind of landscape that I want. So now I've got some serious questions about, well, you know, this is all lovely and, and wonderful, but how do I go about the act of texturing this in a way that uh, draws on what we've done already, right? Because that's what I love to do. I'd love to kind of draw on some of what I've already made. So let's add another base, right? And in this base, I'm going to go ahead and uh, color code this guy to be yellow. And I'm going to call him textures. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a bunch of textures here inside of this base that are then going to fill in all of our uh, instances, right? So one of the many things we can do with instances is, uh, in addition to creating them, we can give them different RGBA, right? We can give them different color values. And we can also give them different texture values. We can texture them all with different uh, images. And that's really what we're up to. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and repeat some of the same process that we've already thought about, right? So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to uh, add a replicator because I want to replicate. I need a table dat. 
I'm going to need, in this case, uh, I can rely on just a base as my master operator. And I'm going to go ahead and call this um, master1. I like to call him master just so I know uh, who it is. I'm going to make it a clone of itself. My table, I'm going to go ahead and just like before, I'm going to locate a file that I want to use. Let's go ahead and use picture index this time. Well, let's use the same one right now. Why not? MR Flickr. We're going to reload that. Excellent. We're going to go inside of our master operator. And uh, we need a, a text. And we need a movie file in. All right, this should all look pretty familiar because we just did it. So we'll repeat that process. So for movie file in, I want to think about um, filling in this particular uh, file, right, by looking at the operator that is one level above me, dot dot slash, called table one. And in fact, it should be called null one, right? Because what I really should do is I should come up here and I should connect this to a null. That's the right way to approach this. So I want to look in null one, and in null one, I want to look in that array for uh, me dot parent dot digits, my parents digits, and that doesn't need to be in quotations. So that's just evaluated as an integer. And then I'd like to look for the column that's called link. And what did I type wrong here? The base comp object has no attribute. Oh, dig, D-I-G, I-T-S, digits. There we go. All right, lovely. Next up, we're going to go ahead and select our text here. We're going to grab null one and drop it in as the dat that we're going to rely on. Let's get rid of this default text. For the row, we're going to ask for uh, me.parent.digits. Again, I'm going to rely on digits to grab that. Just like before for the resolution, uh, for the width of this I'm going to look for the operator that's called movie file in one. So I'm going to look for movie file in and I want uh, the width of that which is 640. And I think last time we let the height be about 150. I also seem to remember that we've left our font size right about 60. That looks pretty good. And then we're going to use a composite top to put these together. We can box select them, drag them onto one another. We want to do over as a composite method. I want to have a little bit of this in here, 25 maybe. I would like the transform here to the fixed layer is going to be 2. I'd like it to be the native resolution, and then I'm going to go ahead and just translate that down a little bit here towards the bottom. Excellent. Mm, that's looking pretty lovely, just like it is. All right, what else do I want to do here? I'm going to go ahead and do one other thing to think about in all of this, right? I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, give this a null, and in fact we're going to give it two nulls, we don't necessarily need to, but um, just in case, or no, that's quite wrong, we do still want two nulls, right, because I want one of these that's going to be my instance that has my label, and one of these is going to be my disk, my display. Okay, so now we have all of the insides of our network here um, kind of put together that we want to have, so we can just going to shrink that because I like it to absolutely represent what it looks like. Great, we're going to back out here. We're going to do the same thing that we've done before. So this is my, well, let's also, while we're here, let's uh, set the operator viewer to be uh, instance, right? So look inside of me dot slash, look inside the thing called instance. This way I can see what it looks like. This is going to be the master operator. The null is going to be our template table. And lo and behold, there are all of our operators all over again. Should feel pretty, pretty familiar so far. Okay, so we've got a bunch of textures that are loaded here. 
uh, inside of our network, but how, how can we take advantage of that? And uh, the kind of secret ingredient in that actually shows up over here in our array, right? So in this array of uh, instance textures, or excuse me, instance geometries, in the instance two page, we're going to uh, write a reference that allows us to grab these guys over here. Now, one of the lovely things about um, many of the elements here in Touch Designer is that we can actually use pattern matching uh, or pattern generation to fill in some of the blanks for us. So what I mean by that is if we were to look at a constant chop, for example. So let's say that I wanted uh, a bunch of empty channels, right? So I could do something like this, Chan 1, Chan 2, Chan 3, Chan Four. This is awfully dreadful. This takes a long time to do. Um, what if I didn't want to do that? What if instead I just want to say, look for channels or make me some empty channels one through ten. Right? So now I've done that bang all right away, all right at once, just by using these brackets to specify that I want the numbers one through ten prefixed by chan. I can use that same kind of idea over here in my instance textures. So um, I want to rely on, well, I need to know two things, right? So I need an index. I need to know where I'm, uh, how I'm specifying which, uh, which one of these I'm using. In this case, I'm going to use index from this table over here, right? This SOC2 table. We're going to use index to help us figure that out. And then the textures that I'm going to use are located inside of textures, right? And then inside of that, I'm looking at item, right? These are all named item. And I'm looking at item 1 through 9. I need to put that in brackets. 1 through 9. And then I'm looking for the thing called instance that lives inside of this. Right? Aha! And there we go. I've got these stack of textures that are now all here. But I'm in a funny order. I'm in an order that doesn't make any sense. And it does, in fact, make sense if we think about how... Uh, our points are ordered in our geometry, right? So unlike what happened in our um, in our container, where we had kind of a top to bottom orientation in terms of the uh, ordering. Here, this is zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, and that's not totally what I want, right? I would like this ideally to still match the other one. All right, so how are we going to change, uh, how are we going to address that problem? And we can address that problem by thinking about some of the orientation of what's going on here. So let's look inside of uh, our reference base here. And let's think about the kind of way that these are ordered, right? Because really what I want is I want these guys here at the bottom to show up at the top. So let's do something crazy, like let's transform. So we're actually just going to transform this. And we're going to rotate it uh, by 180 degrees. <laughs> not 1800 degrees, 180 degrees, and we can see that, uh, sure enough, our points all get moved here to the top. If we were to actually just slide these around, right, we can see how these rotate around that center point, right, how our grid moves. So in this case, by putting it at 180 or negative 180, we've actually just changed the orientation of our grid, and that has in turn reordered our images the way that we wanted them to be. Excellent. Okay. So that's pretty close to, to what we want to have go on over here. So now we've got a part of this kind of uh, taken care of, right? We've got a bunch of different textures that are all showing up. Uh, and those are all piece, uh, put on pieces of geometry. And now I just have to figure out how I get that to show up here on this one uh, over here, right? So we're, we're getting close. We're getting much closer to what we want. Okay, so the next thing we need to consider, or the next thing we need to think about, is how we're going to do some render picking. Because that's really one of the, uh, the kind of ingredients that we're after now. Okay, so to kind of, um, well, we can, we can approach this a bunch of different ways. Right, the tidiest way would be to build another container for all of this to live inside of. And that's actually the approach that we're going to take here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, grab a container. Oops container. There we go. We'll drop them in here. 
we'll go ahead and set the container to have uh, me dot parent par dot w the width and height of our parent because this allows us to change things at the top level and then push down to the bottom. Next we're going to go ahead and grab this uh, render and we're going to drag and drop him right in this container and we're going to copy him into. Right? Let's go ahead and get rid of this guy. Excellent. That's still not quite right what's going on. Don't worry there's still some things we've got to fix. First let's add a null here to the end of this. And we're going to set the null. We're going to give it the name BG for background. Excellent. And you can see that we still have got some things that are broken. Well, what gives? Well, if we look here inside of our container and we look at our render, we can see uh, that on the render page, it's looking for something called camera, anything called geometry, and anything called light. And lo and behold, there's nothing in this level of the hierarchy that possesses any of those attributes. Right, so what we need to do is we need a dot slash, excuse me, a dot dot slash, look above me, dot dot slash, right, and dot dot slash. So now we're looking above, looking at the network above to find those things. For a container, we want the background to show up to be this guy, we just do a background top, dot slash, BG, to set the background to be what's happening inside. Okay, so now that we're inside of our container here, uh, we need to do we need to think about a few different ways to render pick, right? And we can we're going to see what that means here in a second. It'll make a lot more sense. The first thing we need to do is we need to grab a panel chop because we need some information from our panel. Now, from our panel, we want to actually select out of this. We'd like to have select U and V. Those are the things that I'd like to, to know, because that means that when I'm over here mousing on this panel, I get the U and V position, as well as the select when I've actually clicked on something here in my panel. So I'm going to go ahead and rely on this to do a couple of things for me, right? So uh, the next thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to grab a DAT, and I'd like to do a CHOP2. I'm going to convert this to CHOP data. Yoink. Excellent. And then I'm going to, oh, I need to change one other thing here. I want to go ahead and in this shop too, I want to include the names. Select UV. Perfect. And then I'd also like a render pick dat. Now my render pick dat is going to do some really interesting things for me. Uh, I need to go to my options page and I need to set my uh, instance ID. That's going to be one of the, the most important things for me to actually pull out of this. Because now what happens is when I click on uh, one of these instances over here, excellent, uh, I need to make sure that I have a few other things on here. Oh, I need to specify that the render top is this guy up here. Excellent. Okay, now, yes. Okay, so now what I can see is when I click on one of these guys, right, I can see that Lo and behold, what I'm actually getting out of this is I'm getting uh, the XYZ position and then I'm also getting the instance ID, right? So this happens to be instance number five. This happens to be instance eight, zero, etc. cetera. Um, so this is really sexy business. And also, if I uh, click and hold down, we can see those numbers change as I move around the space, right? So there is a lot of very exciting stuff that's happening in this approach. And this is going to get me close to uh, one of the things that I did before, right? Because now what we're going to do is here in this render pick, we're going to go ahead and use it to actually run uh, some scripts for us. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to grab da -da -da, a uh, dat execute. So just like we use a chop execute on the other side, on this side we're going to use a dat execute. For the dat execute, all we're worried about is the table change. So when the table changes, we're going to run uh, this, these scripts, right? That's what we're uh, going to use here as a method. We're going to add a little bit of space. I'm going to go ahead and split my view over here, top bottom. And uh, we'll do the same thing we did before, right? We're going to go ahead and actually pull up 
our text port in DATS because it's going to be really handy to be able to see what's going on inside of our text port while we're working here. Okay, next up, we now need to start to think about how we're going to grab some of those things. So let's start by looking over here at our display and thinking about how we might set this texture to be something different, right? We're going to uh, borrow our screen real estate here for one second. We go in here into display. I'm going to come uh, over here to textures and we'll go into one of our clones, right? So if I add a movie or a select dat on this side, right, we've got a select dat. And let's do the same kind of thing, right? So I know that I can select um, one of these guys from anywhere, and I happen to know that if I change just the number here, right, that changes the picture. Excellent. Now I'm going to take this texture and I'm going to apply it to my constant. And that means that my larger rectangle is now textured with that. Right? Um, and so it, by changing this thing's number, right, so if we change this to 5 or 4, whatever it is, we're changing this guy over here. Okay. So how can we exploit that when we're uh, doing some of our, our scripting on this side? So if we you know, think about that a little bit, right, um, we're going to use the same kinds of things that we did before, right? So I need the number, and my number is going to be equal to um, the value that's up here in my, uh, my render pick. And in fact, before we get there, there's, well, let's, let's do this the messy way, and then we're going to go back and fix it. That's what we're going to end up doing. All right, so uh, the number is going to be equal to um, the operator that's called render pick one. And out of render pick one, I want the first, oops, yeah, was a, I would like to have what is in the first row, and then I want um, the thing that's called, the column that's called instance. Okay, let's, for fun games and profit, let's print this real fast. So let's print num. So this should mean that when I click on one of these guys over here, Oh, and we need to make sure that we uh, set the corresponding thing to work down here, right? So table change is what I'm looking for. And table changes on. The dat that we're looking at is render pick. Excellent. Okay. Lo and behold, there we go. That's zero. This is eight. Great. Now, in this case, I should remember that over here in my textures, right, we're numbered one to nine, not zero to eight. So one of the things that I need to do right out the gate here, right, because I know that if I click on the one that should be in the one position, I get zero. So what I need to do is I need to actually take this number and I need to add one to it. So now when I click on this guy, I get one. Excellent. Okay. When I click down here, I get nine. That's what I want. So far, so good. Okay, so just like before, um, I'm going to need to have a path start. I'm also going to need to have a path end. Right, and if I come back over here and look inside of disk and look again at how this is formatted, I know that my path start begins with dot dot slash textures slash item, item, right? Then my number happens. And then the end of my path is going to be slash disp. So again, if we were to, if we were to print out uh, my path, right? So if we were to print uh, path start plus, plus num, plus path end, 
Those of you who remember what happened last time should expect that we're going to actually encounter an error when we do this, right? We should run into an error, right? Because I still can't convert an integer into a string implicitly. What do you know? So I need to tell it that I want this to actually be a string. That is what I want that to be. All right, and there we go, right? So textures, item for disk. So I've gone ahead and set that up. That's pretty good. Okay, next thing, I'm going to go ahead and define my target again. And my target in this case is going to be the operator that's up one level, and it's inside of disk. And inside of disk is called select one. And the thing that I want to do is I would like um, for um, what I want to have happen is I would like my target dot parameter dot top to be equal to path start plus num plus path end. All right, and we're going to go ahead and comment this out because we don't really need it right now. Because what we should see, if we're lucky, oh, look at that. We did just what we expected to do. That's, we're pretty swanky. There is, however, a terrible caveat that we need to be aware of, which is that this space that exists in between instances also counts as an area that might return a result, right? So for example, if I click and hold and I drag to the right, I'll see that once I hit this black space, I get nothing that shows up until I cross into the new one, right? So this means that um, as I'm clicking, if I miss that, right, if I click in any of these empty areas, then I don't get anything that displays. It also means that if I click on the image over here, I don't get anything that displays. And I don't really like that. I would like to build something that I know is going to behave reliably enough that I don't have to think about whether or not my um, user or whether or not my operator might or might not encounter a dead zone in my interface. Okay, so how, how might I think about doing that? Well, instead of, well, let's run a logical test, right? That's really what we need to do. do. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this thing test. We're going to grab this whole thing right here. And we're going to use him to actually run a test for us. So that's going to be test. Test plus one. Oops. Which means that the number that I want right is actually uh, this. I'm going to make a string out of test plus one. OK. And um, then we're going to do uh, another thing here, right? Because instead of just target, uh, what I'm going to do is I want to have something called no change. And no change is going to be uh, target dot top, target dot par dot top. Okay, and let's get rid of this guy. Yoink. So what am I up to? What I'm up to is I'm going to write. We're going to write an if statement, right? So if test is less than or equal to negative one, which if we look over here, right, let's look up here at render pick, and we'll see that if I'm in this inner space, then I get negative one as the instance that I'm encountering. So if it is less than or equal to negative one, or I could even say equal equal, right? If it's exactly negative one, colon, I want you to let uh, target dot R dot top be no change. So it's going to stay exactly what it was. Else, in every other circumstance, target dot par dot top is going to be equal to path start plus num plus path end. Okay. And we can go ahead and get rid of our debugging statement there. We don't need it. So now this means that as long as we're clicked on one of these guys, right, as long as we are hitting an instance that is 
uh, not negative 1. If I'm ever in negative 1, the parameter doesn't change at all. If I'm hitting an actual instance, then I do change the parameter. And that's actually um, what I want it to do, right? Okay, so now we can go ahead and get rid of that. Perfect. We don't actually need to see any of these guys. We don't need to see this guy either. When we back out here, we should be able to see that, lo and behold, our script is still running just as it should be. And now we have two different ways to solve the same problem, right? Like, okay, well that's great, Matt, but, you know, why, why one versus the other? Well, you can do things with this method that we could never do, right, with this 2D uh, method, right? Because we can start to think about how we um, negotiate or manipulate pieces of geometry, right? So, like, if we were to, for example, dive into our reference here, we might think about how we wanted to uh, build in an animation sequence, right, uh, that moved our control panel. So if we rotated, for example, uh, based on abs time dot uh, seconds, or maybe abs time dot frame, that's going to be too fast, right? But now we've got a moving control panel, and we still have our instance IDs that are attached to it. And we could take the same thing, right, and we could uh, rotate in uh, our z-space as well. So now we've got this thing that's actually moving and shifting, um, you know, something that we're interacting with that's creating all sorts of very interesting kind of patterns, and that's something that we certainly can't do over here with our kind of 2D array, right? We can't do that in any way, shape, or form. We might even think about, you know, if this isn't enough for us, this kind of like movement isn't enough. Uh, we could also think about, well, how do we add some uh, noise to this, right? Because we could also add some, some noise to how this thing moves inside of space. We can begin to really kind of dive into creating a much more, a much richer experience for uh, the operator or for the, the person that's actually interacting with this thing. You know, likewise, we might think about, uh, you know, maybe we, we like this kind of transformation, like let's leave just maybe one of these, this kind of rotation action. But let's come over here to our buttons. Uh, and instead of having um, our, our kind of rectangles here, let's uh, use a grid instead. And we're going to actually just go ahead and plug a grid into this. And we'll see in a hot second how this starts to change the kind of aesthetic quality of what's going on here. So in our grid, let's go ahead and let's change this to be a polygon instead. Um, let's add some noise. Right, we're going to noisy up this guy. Those have all got this kind of like goofy, wavy, dribbly quality to them now. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, take that and think about how we might use our facet, right? We looked at facet in class the other day. We're going to use unique points, and we're going to compute normals. And we're going to see here that we've got this kind of like ripply, crazy kind of quality. I'm going to go ahead and actually turn off the transformation, because I don't need it to transform in real time. It's fine that it's just like that to me. And let's uh, turn down the complexity of this a little bit so we have something that feels a little bit uh, more rough and tumble. Right? Okay. Excellent. Once while we're at it, we're going to go ahead and replace this with a fong instead of with our constant. So now we have something that generates shadows, um, but we've run into a problem, right? And the problem is that we need a light to actually be able to see what's happening. So let's back out here. Let's assume that we're doing this with a machine that's got a little beefier kind of graphics card in it. We can add a light to our scene. And now by adding a light to our scene, uh, we can see that we've got this kind of uh, chunky quality to our instances that we didn't have before, right? Or maybe we decide that we don't like that at all. We want to actually stick with our uh, constant. Bring that back. Let's get rid of that. 
We'll go back to our rectangle. We like that best after all. Right, but now all of a sudden we have options in terms of how we manipulate uh, or navigate these, these objects that we didn't have before. In fact, we might even come in here and think about, okay, well maybe I don't want this actually to do uh, this kind of transformation. Well, let's go back to 180, right? But I do want it to have some noise. I do want there to be some kind of like drift and movement inside of the position of these. Right, okay. And maybe what I want is I actually don't want uh, these guys to exist in this way. Um, I want them to be a box instead, right? So let's see what that might look like. And um, for my texture coordinates, let's just rely on base coordinates. Excellent. And then let's take that and in the Z direction, we'll make these uh, a little bit larger. So we'll make them like four here. We'll translate all of those guys back a bit. We'll go back like negative three. Right, so now we've got these kind of like towers of texture that we're working with. They're backwards though, so we uh, just have to make one change. We'd have to go here into our textures. And here for our instance texture, we need to flip. And there we go. Right, so now we've got kind of this shape to it. This would be another place where maybe what we want after all is for our buttons, we do want to have a fong, right? We'd like there to be some sense of lighting in this world. So let's add a light back into our scene. And now our light is only striking the surface of those uh, because of its position. But we could think about moving our light closer, right? Or maybe there's a light that's placed back here or the light moves in some interesting or different way and how it illuminates and, and kind of changes and shifts our scene slightly. So now all of a sudden we have options um, in terms of creating an interface that we would never have had before if we were dealing just with 2D space. We can begin to think about how we create something dimensionally that we can interact with rather than something that just exists in a flat raster. Uh, let's fix one other thing that's going to like drive me bananas if we don't. So here in reference, here in our noise, we just need to remember that our transform needs to be uh, abs time five seconds. And this will make sure that we don't repeat any of those. So we'll get rid of the jitters that we have there. All right, so that's another way to solve the same problem. Uh, and both of these running at 60 frames a second, right? So if we middle click here, we can see the CPU cook time, and this is about 0.6. Um, and the CPU cook time on this is about 0.7, uh, you know, very similar in terms of what they're going to cost us. Um, and it would really be a matter of us thinking about what is the right interface for the kind of installation or the kind of project that we're working on. So there we have uh, kind of two different ways to think about some of the same problem. All right.